Hi, I'm Dr. J, and this is a video about regression diagnostics. This video exists in a playlist all about regression. That's a link up here, hopefully. And there's a PDF version of these slides down below. Now, diagnostics is really all about understanding what aspects of our model are good or bad. And since we're talking about statistics, we'll be talking about statistical models. You might have heard the phrase, all models are wrong, but if that's extended, sometimes it's all models are wrong, but some are useful. And there's a really nice response to somebody asking on Stack Exchange about what this comment means. And so I just thought I would repeat it here. So although there's a video and it's a terrible idea, I'm just going to read in uh, the response that the individual gave that I thought was spot on. So first off, all models are wrong in the sense that they're a simplification of reality. Some models, especially in the hard scientists, think about uh, Newtonian mechanical models, they're only a little wrong. They typically ignore things like friction or gravitational effects of small bodies, uh, but other models can be a lot wrong, uh, and they might ignore much bigger things. So that's the sense in which we mean that all models are wrong. Now, what do we mean that some are useful? Some are useful just means that these simplifications of reality can be helpful. Right? They can help us explain, predict, or understand the universe and all its various components. And the question on Stack Exchange was really about what does this mean in statistics, but the response, the answer, pointed out that this is not just specific to statistics. That uh, models uh, are all over the place, are used in a wide variety of fields, and you've probably used models before without even knowing that they're models. For example, maps are a type of model. They are definitely wrong, but a good map, right, especially those that we have these days on our phones, are extremely useful. So diagnostics is all about the idea of trying to assess what aspects of our model are sufficiently bad that they no longer become useful. This is perhaps the first example in all the videos that I've had in these past three different playlists that really get into the art of doing statistics as opposed to the science of doing statistics where there are clear right and wrong answers, diagnostics or evaluating models now gets into a gray area of understanding what's important and what's not important. And because it's a gray area, it really takes a lot of years of experience to uh, get up to speed on what aspects of a model make it poor or okay for a particular purpose. So this is really just getting uh, the first uh, ideas of what regression diagnostics or regression model assumptions we can evaluate and therefore how we can decide whether to continue using our regression model or try to find something better. Uh, as a reminder, we have our simple linear regression model. We have a response variable y. The responses are independent, normally distributed with a mean that's beta naught plus beta one times xi, the explanatory variable for the ith observation, or the common variance sigma squared. Now, it's gonna be helpful to rewrite this model in this format. We basically just kind of pull out that mean, and so we say that yi is equal to beta naught plus beta one times xi plus this new ei. And the key when we pull that out, this ei, which we previously referred to as the error, these errors are now iid, normally distributed with a mean of zero and a variance of sigma squared. All right, this is gonna be helpful when we try to understand what the assumptions are in this regression model. Basically, almost all of the assumptions are about those errors. In particular, the errors are normally distributed, they are have constant variance, and they are independent of each other. So that's uh, the assumptions that we have about the errors. Then we have one additional assumption, and it has to do with the relationship between the response and the explanatory. In a particular, the expected response has a linear relationship with the explanatory variable, xi. Now, this, uh, we're really only talking so far about simple linear regression, but this is actually a much more broad statement. So here is the first view of a multiple regression model. And you'll notice that there's gonna be a number of other betas and x's floating up there, and that's not so important for our purposes right now. But the main thing to notice is that we still have those errors and there's still iid normal mean zero variance sigma squared. So all those assumptions about the errors from our simple linear regression model just translate over to our multiple regression model. The assumption that changes is that last assumption, 
where now we have this specific relationship between the mean of the response and our set of explanatory variables. So we're not going to go into that one in too much detail today in this video. Uh, mainly we're going to be focusing on those errors. All right, so in our previous videos, we've been talking about this telomere data set where we have our response as telomere length and our uh, explanatory variable is the years since diagnosis. We're going to use this again to go through a whole bunch of graphs that try to look at different uh, model assumptions and therefore are providing our diagnostics about those model assumptions. In order to do that, we're going to uh, calculate a bunch of what are called case statistics. Case here could be is synonymous with observation. So these are just observation specific statistics or case statistics. We're going to be talking very briefly about leverage, fitted values, residuals, two different kinds of those residuals, and Cook's distance as our primary techniques for understanding our model assumptions that we're going to be using these statistics as diagnostics when uh, put into plots. All right, so let's talk about leverage. Uh, or maybe before we get there, uh, this is just an example of all the default plots in R. We're going to be going through these one at a time in a couple of slides, but for now I just wanted to point out some of the terminologies that are in these plots like residuals, fitted values, standardized residuals, Cook's distance, leverage, right? All these quantities that we're going to be talking about, right? This is why we're talking about them because they show up in default plots for regression diagnostics. All right, so leverage. Leverage of an observation is really a measure of how far away that observation's explanatory variable value is from the other observation's explanatory variable values. Right? So you can just kind of imagine your head, right? If you put all the explanatory variables on a line, like on the x-axis, right? Then you might have a mass here, right? With a new observation or one observation you're looking at with the, the explanatory variable value way out here. And that would be a much different leverage than if the leverage was right in the mass of all those data points. And so leverage is just trying to get you an understanding of how far away this observation is. Uh, it only goes between zero and one. So one means very far away and zero means basically right in the center of that uh, distribution for that explanatory variable. The actual calculation of leverage um, is this quantity right here, at least for simple linear regression. There is a uh, formula for multiple regression, but it just gets more complex and the idea is still the same. And the main key with leverage is that leverage identifies the potential for an observation to have a large influence on the regression. It doesn't mean that it has a large influence, it just means that it has the possibility to have a large influence. In a bit, we're going to be plotting uh, leverage, but we're also going to be uh, calculating the variance for residuals and standardizing some residuals. And so I just wanted to point out right now that the variance of a residual depends on the leverage HI. Uh, in R, you can get access to the leverage. So here's the leverage for the telomere data because the leverage only depends on the explanatory variable value. I've only put the unique values of years since diagnosis. And you'll just notice here, number one, uh, that the uh, smallest leverage is right in the middle there of those values, right? So right around six, I think that's the smallest leverage, with the leverage increasing the farther away that you get from six. And so when we say that leverage is a measure of how far away an observation's explanatory variable value is, from the mean or from the mass of explanatory variable values of the other observations, that's what we mean. Okay, so uh, then the next case statistic we'll talk about are residuals. We've talked about these before. I'm going to rewrite our simple linear regression model like this. And um, the reason I'm going to do that is because when we get multiple regression, we're going to still have this idea of a mu i just equal to beta naught plus beta 1 x 1 plus beta 2 x 2 and so forth. Right, just expanding that mu equals to equation. And now if we want to get a uh, fitted value, the fitted value is just sort of our best guess about what that observation should be. Our best guess would be the expectation. The expectation is just beta naught plus beta one times x one, but now we don't know beta naught and beta one, so we just plug in our estimated values for beta one and beta zero. So that's the fitted value. And now if we want a residual, the residual is just the observation minus that fitted value. All right, so we get the residuals. One issue with the residuals is that they have a variance, uh, right? 
the, actually the errors have a variance of sigma squared. And so what we might want to do is sort of standardize these residuals. In order to standardize the residual, we're going to divide by its standard deviation or its standard error. And uh, we had a couple slides ago that formula for the variance of a residual. It was just sigma times the square root of one minus the leverage. And we just plug in our point estimate here for that uh, standard deviation. And now we can standardize the residuals. So there's one issue here that if there's a particular residual that has a very large absolute value, then it can have an overly large impact on our estimate for that standard deviation sigma. Right, you can just see here, this is the sum of the residuals squared. If one of those residuals is really large uh, in absolute value, then it's gonna dominate that sum. And so one thing we can do is that we can, uh, we can calculate what's called an externally studentized residual, where we just take that observation out when we estimate sigma, and instead of dividing by the estimate for sigma, times the square root of one minus leverage, we just plug in that alternative value for sigma. Now these terminologies do not seem to be, be very standardized. Uh, that is standardized, sometimes it's called studentized, sometimes studentized refers to externally studentized. And so if you're using different software, you just have to be careful with which one they're talking about. With that being said, it's not all that important because the key with these standardized or studentized residuals is that you can now compare them to a standard normal. That is, that variance has sort of been accounted for, and we can look at, see how many of the residuals are outside, say, plus or minus two standard deviations. And that can help us understand whether our residuals are falling where we expect them to be or not. Uh, all right, so here in R is, uh, and there's code. If you, you know, go down below, there'll be a link uh, to get the code. But if you want the code, um, or if you want an R to get all these values, you can get those values. Right? The leverage, the residuals, the standardized, the studentized, and so forth. All right, the last case statistic we're gonna talk about is something called Cook's distance. This is a positive value that indicates how much the regression parameter estimates change when that observation is included or excluded from the model. All right, so if the Cook's distance is large, then it means those parameter estimates changed a lot, and that means that that observation is having a large influence on the regression output. Uh, operationally, um, I've heard rules of thumb of saying if this D is, this Cook's distance is greater than one or greater than four over N, the number of observations, uh, then that's a cause for concern. I am definitely interested down in the comments below if you guys have other suggestions for uh, what are good rules of thumb for looking at Cook's distance. Uh, all right, so now we're just gonna walk one by one through the plots uh, that are the default regression plots in R. And we're gonna talk about what we might see in these plots if the model was truly terrible for these data. So the first plot is a residuals versus fitted values plot. So residuals on the y-axis, fitted values on the x-axis. And there are two possible assumptions that we'll be evaluating using this plot. The first one that I listed here is whether or not there's a linear relationship between the mean of the response and the explanatory variables. Uh, if you see some kind of curvature, like a quadratic curve here, that would be an indication that uh, maybe you need uh, a better model in terms of that linearity assumption. The second thing we're looking for in this plot is some kind of funnel pattern, or some call this a trumpet pattern, or it's a triangle pattern. Basically, what you most commonly see is on the left side, the variability in these residuals is relatively small, but as you go from that left side to the right side, that variability increases. And so that can be an indication that in fact, you should not have a constant variance assumption. That variance, it seems to be changing, perhaps with the explanatory variable value, right? And you might want to choose a better model that accounts for that variability in the, in the variance. The next diagnostic plot in R is called a QQ plot. I'm not gonna go into vast details about what a QQ plot is, but basically what we want to see is that the points here fall along the line. Now again, no model is perfect, so we're never gonna see the points exactly on the line, but if you have large deviations away from that line, uh, typically that occur at either ends of this distribution, then there are problems uh, uh, with the assumption of normality for your model. 
one thing I should have mentioned is that when it, students first get exposed to these diagnostics, they want to see patterns everywhere. And so they think immediately every plot that they see shows that the model is terrible. And so, right, and that's partly because humans are good at identifying patterns. Uh, we have to relax our um, restrictions a bit and notice one, that there's just variability with the data that we see in everyday life. And so we're never gonna fit things perfectly. Uh, and two, we just need experience understanding when are the violations or the deviations from what we expect to see bad enough that it actually makes a difference. This plot right here, right, this looks like a totally reasonable QQ plot, right? No evidence in my mind that the normality assumption is not a reasonable assumption. Okay, so third plot. Uh, third plot uh, in R has the square root of the standardized residuals versus the fitted values. The main thing you're looking for in this plot uh, is an increasing or decreasing trend here, which would indicate that there's not a constant variance. So this is a second plot where we might see that assumption being violated. Uh, in R, it's nice because they put a smoother line on there for you. So that red line is a smoother line. You'll see in this example, that line is almost flat, right? So no indication that that variance is not constant. If you saw that line going up or going down and doing so by quite a bit, then that might be a cause for concern. The fourth plot is a plot just strictly of Cook's distance versus the observation number. Uh, basically, it's just trying to show you if Cook's distance is large. Remember those uh, sort of arbitrary thresholds of one over or four over the sample size, um, right? You can take a look and try to identify whether you see any observations that are being influential in your regression. Uh, in this plot, this all looks totally reasonable. Uh, the la the Fifth plot in R is the residuals versus leverage. Uh, so we have the standardized residuals on the y-axis, we have leverage on the x-axis. Uh, and really what you're looking for here are points that fall outside of these red dashed lines that you can barely make out because these data are so well behaved um, that it's not a problem. And if you do see uh, observations outside of those lines, that indicates that Cook's distance is large. You probably would have identified that from the previous plot anyway, uh, and that would just be another indication that you might have observations that are being influential. Uh, this last plot uh, is, is crazy busy, and in fact, uh, I don't get a lot of value out of it. I typically don't look at it. Uh, please tell me in the comments below if you find this uh, extremely helpful and explain to me why it's helpful. All right, so the thing is that these default plots in R and in other so statistical software packages don't answer all the model assumptions. And so I suggest you at least make two additional plots whenever you're looking at diagnostics. The first is plot your residuals versus the row number. This is trying to get at the idea of lack of independence uh, because typically data are inputted uh, in the order that they were received. So that row order is really a, a proxy for time. The second plot that I suggest you create is a residuals versus explanatory variable plot. And now if you're doing multiple regression, you should do this for every explanatory variable that you have. All right, so this is an example with that telomere data of looking at residuals versus the row index. Basically, if you see a pattern here, that might indicate that there's a lack of independence in your residuals. This plot looks pretty reasonable, but it's a little bit weird how you have from index about 16 to 24, you just have this increasing pattern going there. So I'd certainly be curious to understand if there's any reason uh, for that observation. If we look at the residual versus explanatory variable value, the main thing you're looking for here is some kind of curvature. And again, that would mean that a linear model might not be appropriate and you might want a more sophisticated model. The last thing I want to talk about in these plots is an R package called ggResidPanel. Uh, it makes what I think are nicer looking plots uh, using ggplot2. Uh, and so here is the uh, equivalent of doing the default plots in R. The default in R actually only shows you four plots. I showed you all six just because you can access to them pretty quickly. Um, if you want access to all six, uh, here they are. Um, or at least here are a set of six plots, not quite the same as we had before, but right, you get that index plot that I was suggesting down on the bottom left, right? Uh, right, you see sort of that same pattern that I was showing you before. You also get an Instagram in case that's of interest. Um, there's also a way in the package to get versus the explanatory variable. The function here is resid underscore x panel, so that's convenient. It will show you all of those uh, plots in case you had multiple 
explanatory variables. Uh, if your preference is to work with SAS, you can also get SAS style diagnostic plots um, right there. Okay, so uh, in summary, we've talked about regression diagnostics, a number of different plots, especially in R, that you can use to evaluate model assumptions. These are all based on case statistics, and those case statistics try to look at these model assumptions, normality, constant variance, independence, and linearity. I hope you enjoyed the, the uh, video. I hope this gets you a start at addressing diagnostics and regression. Certainly, there's a lot more experience that needs to be gained before you become an expert at looking at those plots. Uh, the next video, I'll talk about using logarithms, logarithms in regression, both with the response and the explanatory variable. Hope to catch you there.